Hi, everyone, all over this beautiful world of ours. Laszlo Montgomery again, coming to you, as always, from the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. I did leave you hanging last week, didn't I? Well, today we're going to get right into the launching of the Cultural Revolution. Mid-1966 is when the whole thing finally reaches critical mass. Let's quickly review last week's lead-up to Part 2. 1954, Khrushchev's secret speech really spooks Mao. Then things fall apart between China and the Soviet Union until 1964, when Khrushchev was overthrown and Brezhnev took over. By now, Mao sees a Cassius and a Brutus behind every bush, and Mao's omnipotent power and prestige took a huge hit from the blowback from the Great Leap Forward. Peng Dehuai dared to speak up, privately, mind you, not in front of anyone else, that this whole idea might have sounded good on paper, but didn't seem to work out too well. This couldn't have been easy for Mao to do, to get rid of Peng Dehuai. They were both born right around the same area in Xiangtan, in Hunan, Mao, five years before Peng. They met in the late 1920s, Mao, Peng, Zhu De, Zhu De, not from Hunan, he was from Sichuan. Peng and Mao both spoke the same dialect. You know, that means a lot. They used to have meals together under the stars, leading the revolution, building the new China. And when this decent guy, Peng Dehuai, who came from the poorest of poor in a poor part of China, when he says to Mao, you know, this great leap forward thing wasn't such a good idea. Well, Mao sacrificed Peng immediately. And when he hung him out to dry in front of all the top party leaders at Lushan, his message was... Look what I did to my closest friend from my Jiaxiang, my homie. He went against me. Look what I did to him. Anyone else got anything to say about the Great Leap? That was a major fork in the road for the CCP in 1959. If the prevailing attitude amongst the highest leaders was to be careful around Mao, after Peng Dehuai was whacked, they really knew they were walking on eggshells wherever and whenever it concerned Mao. But, as we know, so vast and in-your-face was the devastation caused by the famine that followed the Great Leap that even Mao himself had to make some kind of mea culpa. And, you know, to prove he was a good sport, the great man stepped back and allowed the people who knew what they were doing to take over the government and the party. Mao, the great philosopher and theoretician, would retire to the sidelines and just sort of be a chairman emeritus, to be consulted on all kinds of matters that might require his sagacity. Except they didn't come too often. And Mao even saw himself satirized in public. He began to see his whole legacy being methodically and slowly deconstructed, and he didn't like that. Not that any one of us can ever know what it was like to be Mao and imagine how he was looking at all this, but he was not happy at all. Now, there's something else that has to be emphasized. In addition to fighting back against those who were overtly or inadvertently trying to diminish his legacy, the other thing that got under Mao's skin was the way that it seemed only lip service was being paid to ideology. Chairman Mao truly believed that the masses of peasants and workers had to continuously be politically indoctrinated by all these mass movements. He felt you had to constantly stir things up and keep a nice froth going in order to make this whole thing work. You couldn't sit still and fall back to the same old ways with the same old traditional ruling elite running things from the top down. If this happened, then it was only natural that everything would revert to the kind of system that the revolution had tried to overthrow. But the other guys were saying to Mao, they said, yeah, but if we do what you say, the economy is going to tank and, you know, normal orderly society will break down into every man for himself. But because of what happened to Peng De Huai, no one could actually say that or even infer it. So as Mao stayed on the sidelines, 62, 63, 64, 65, trying to show everyone he, he still had it, the top leaders were doing their utmost to balance the building of the Chinese economy and state and at the same time having to put up with Mao's demands. And it wasn't easy. So first goes Peng De Huai, and in this episode, it's going to be another Peng, uh, this time Beijing mayor, party boss, and all-around strongman in the capital, Peng Zhen. We're going to feature Peng Zhen in another podcast, just focusing on him one day. 
But uh, for now, he is going to be the first of Mao's victims. And to give you an idea how powerful he was, back in 1965, Peng, in addition to being the top guy in the capital, was also chairman of the standing committee of the NPC, the National People's Congress. So that was like uh, Wu Bang Guo today. They weren't ranked the same, but just trying to illustrate, Peng Jun was an extremely high-ranking member of the party elite. He was the first one to get it. He had his old friend Kang Sheng to thank for that. Now, we also introduced Lin Biao in the last episode. He replaced Peng De Huai as the defense minister and cut a secret deal with Mao, whereby Lin would bring the army over to Mao's side and you know, carry out whatever political indoctrination that was necessary and would be sure to stuff the ranks of the party with members from the military. You know, and at the same time, he'd, he'd watch Mao's back. Then Mao makes a very calculated move, and in late February 1965, he sends his wife, Jiang Qing, to Shanghai and tells Lin to find a place for her. So Lin Biao sticks Jiang Qing in the cultural department of the PLA, and there she just blossoms and starts networking with all the hotheads and radicals of Shanghai. And all the while, she's reporting everything back to the chairman and to Kang Sheng. So right away, Mao knows he has a hugely untapped power base down there in Shanghai, where the Communist Party was born. So as our story opens today, end of 65, beginning of 66, the battle lines are clearly being drawn. The Maoists on one side, you know, in addition to the chairman, this includes everything Lin Biao brought to the table, namely the PLA, and now this brand new and powerful element, these young student radicals based in and around Shanghai. This presented a whole new potential pool of energy and revolutionary fervor to tap into. Students and young people were the best in Mao's way of thinking. Their brains weren't yet tainted by the old corrupting traditional ways. So let's start with the whole Hai Rui thing. The eminent literary star Wu Han served also in an honorary role as vice mayor of Beijing. He was one of Peng Jun's people, very respected for his work on Ming Dynasty history. He wrote an article and then turned the article into a play called Hai Rui Ba Guan, Hai Rui Dismissed from Office. As I explained last time, Hai Rui lived during the time of the Jia Jing Emperor of the Ming Dynasty, and he spoke up against you know, some of the excesses of the Emperor, and for his honesty, he was rewarded with a dismissal from his imperial post. Now, anyone with some historical background and some common sense would be able to easily conclude this play was pretty much an allegory for what Mao did for Peng De Huai, but no one would come out and you know say it. For to do so might invite unwanted trouble. So, the strategy Peng Jun took once the heat got turned up on this issue was to do what, you know, the party leaders always did in these cases. They looked into it, prepared a nice, big, fat, detailed report, and concluded, nothing here, nothing to be alarmed about, we're on top of it, Chairman Mao. So they sort of shined him on and hoped Mao would drop the matter. With Peng Jun, Mao was going to show he wasn't playing games anymore. And the way he got to Peng Jun was through Wuhan, and the way he got to Wuhan was via Jiang Qing, and the way Jiang Qing got to Wuhan was through Yao Wenyuan. Yao Wenyuan was one of the future gang of four. Wheels within wheels. Now, one last thing before we set off this first pile of dynamite that launches the Cultural Revolution. I want to mention how Lin Biao seized complete control of the military. Mao made him the defense minister, but that didn't mean Lin had everyone's loyalty. The military was still laced with Peng De Huai people. These were the professional military soldiers who cared more about defending the country than about singing political songs and studying party propaganda, you know, and that kind of thing. These were the guys Lin Biao had to get rid of in order to do what he had to do. And that was politicized the PLA as a force to support Mao rather than to say, oh, how shall one say this, uh, than to defend the uh, Chinese nation. Now, to do this, he had to get rid of a certain guy, Luo Ching. Luo sort of stood for all that the professional, no-nonsense PLA was all about. Lin Biao had to get rid of this guy and root out his whole power base. But there was only one catch. Chairman Mao really liked this guy. He called him Tall Law, 
Yeah, he liked him, but Ma was willing to betray him to get what he ultimately wanted. So he threw this decent man, a long marcher, military hero, general in the army, he threw him under the bus, and Lin Biao made fast work of Luo Ruiqing. This is all in the final quarter of 1965, and after running Law through the ringer for the better part of early 1966, in April of that year, Law was out, and so are all of his lieutenants and allies. The military was now in the hands of Lin Biao, and if he had detractors, they were laying real low. So, October 1965, an interesting thing happens. Mao bolts from Beijing and sets up shop in the south, mostly in Shanghai in a nice villa in Hangzhou on West Lake. He stays there for nine months. This is where he's planning his next move. And it's down there in Hangzhou where both Jiang Qing and Kang Sheng kept whispering in Mao's ear about how he had to do something about this Wuhan matter. Clearly, Wuhan's 1961 play, Hai Rui, dismissed from office, was a direct, full frontal assault on the person of the chairman, and everyone knew it. And they both really rile up the chairman. And Mao didn't need too much persuading on this point. So here's how they lit the match that lit the fuse. This is where Yao Wenyuan gets involved. Yao and Zhang Chunxiao, another member of the Gang of Four, were propagandists working for the radical Maoist Shanghai party boss, Ke Qing Shi. Ke was firmly in Mao's camp, so he got one of his guys to write this article that would set the record straight about Wuhan and his play. And this was the last thing uh, Ke Qing Shi did before he up and died from lung cancer shortly thereafter. So under orders from Mao, Jiang Qing, his 33-year-old Yao Wenyuan, write this article that attacked Wuhan's play. And he clearly showed it was anti-Mao, anti-party, anti-proletariat, you know, you name it. A poisonous weed. After many writes and rewrites, Mao approved it for publication in the paper. And so this article was published on November 10th in the Shanghai paper Wen Hui Bao, and the next day in the Liberation Daily. It didn't run in any Beijing papers because no one in their right mind up there was going to publish anything or shine any light on any article that was critical of Peng Zhen. And then something shocking happened. Just as Yao's article hit the streets of Shanghai, Mao issued a central document, or these are known as Zhongfa, that you know he as the CCP chairman had the authority to do. Sort of like an executive order that no one could say anything about no matter what. In this Zhongfa, he dismissed Yang Shangkun as head of the party's general office, which was sort of a central services for all internal party documents and communication, among other things. And in Yang Shangkun's stead was placed another person who would join the rogues gallery of the Cultural Revolution. This was Wang Dongxing. He was a major general who ran Unit 8341 that, among other things, was the palace guard that provided security for the Politburo members. He also personally guarded all access to Mao. Not even Jiang Qing could get face time with her husband unless Wang Dongxing said it was okay. Mao trusted Wang Dongxing almost like no one else. Mao then set his trap up nicely. Peng Zhan knew his goose was cooked whichever direction he turned. If he ignored the article written by Yao... That meant it was all true, and he was a revisionist calling for peaceful evolution that, you know, the article accused him of being. If he attacked it, it was like an attack on Mao. It was only on November 26th that Zhou Enlai figured out what was going on and that Yao was simply Mao's mouthpiece and that if Peng knew what was good for him, better get that article published in Beijing. And he did this on November 26th, and then the next day, Yao Wenyuan's article was printed in the People's Daily the mouthpiece of the party. Peng Zhen fought the good fight, though. He did his best to marshal his forces, to fight back and say this whole thing was just purely an academic matter, not political at all. And all kinds of articles were written in the wake of publishing this Yao Wenyuan piece that, you know, tried to deflect the argument. And in December, Lin Biao's witch hunt to destroy his enemy, Luo Rei Qing, came to fruition and Luo and his people were out. This was particularly distasteful to the party leaders, such as Zhou, Deng, Liu, and Peng. Luo was a good man, and a four-star general with, you know, long march street cred, yet he was unceremoniously dumped. Then, for the next few months, he was criticized, and even his longtime friends and allies had no choice but to chime in, or else. 
And then on March 18th, Law tried to commit suicide by jumping off the roof of his house. He survived, but he demolished his legs. And when Peng Zhen delivered the final report to Mao on the struggle against Luo Ching, his attempted suicide was all the proof that was needed to show his crimes were all real. On February 4th, it was 1966 now, came Peng Zhen's February outline. This was a document that was supposed to put this whole Wuhan Hai Rei affair to rest. It concluded that this whole Wuhan thing was academic and not political at all. Everyone signed off on this. Peng, you know, of course, and Lu Ding Yi from the cultural department, but not only them, Zhou Enlai, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, they all signed off. Mao was down in Wuhan when he received it on February 7th. Peng Zhen personally delivered it with Lu Ding Yi and Kang Sheng present and Wu Lengxi from the People's Daily. And they presented it to Mao, and Mao, you know, argued with them, of course, and insisted it was, you know, this thing is political in nature, and so Mao didn't approve it. Peng's February outline. He didn't approve it, but he also didn't disapprove it. So it ended up being circulated at the top of the party, and Peng Zhen breathed a sigh of relief, because it seemed, in his eyes, Mao was finally dropping this matter. The only problem was Mao didn't drop the matter. For the first few months of 1966, Peng Zhen was sort of left twisting in the wind. He thought he dodged that bullet, but he couldn't be sure. At the end of March, Mao was holed up with the likes of Kang Sheng, Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, planning his strategy and making it plainly known that he wasn't happy how Peng Zhen handled this whole thing. So, end March, early April, suddenly, everyone woke up and saw what was happening, and the ghosts of the 1959 Lushan Conference started to creep up on those who wondered secretly what might happen to them if they went against the chairman on this one. So even Liu, Zhou, and Deng had to go against Peng Zhen when the moment came. And come it did on April 16th, 1966, at a standing committee meeting, the Sanctum Sanctorum of the CCP. At one of these meetings, they all agreed Peng Zhen committed errors, namely, he contravened Mao Zedong thought and opposed Chairman Mao. And three days later, for the sake of Mao's convenience, a meeting of the standing committee was called down to uh, Hangzhou, and Peng attended this one in person. And everyone knew what the purpose of this meeting was. Ma was going to extract his pound of flesh from Peng for standing up to him all this time and not showing the respect that was due. Peng got there and he, you know, he asked, can I have 20 minutes alone with Mao? But chairman denied him. There wasn't going to be a whole lot of mercy for Peng Chun on this day. And then he was out. And if Peng Chun thought that it couldn't get much worse than this, he was sorely mistaken. And not that Liu Shaoqi could have saved Peng, but he was conveniently on an overseas tour and not present until after it was a fait accompli. But not having Liu Shaoqi around certainly made it much easier for Mao to steamroll this whole thing forward. On April 24, a Central Party document came out that annulled Peng's February outline that you know had concluded the whole Wuhan Hai Rei affair, ain't no thing. And then Peng's group of five was disbanded. And this group was replaced by a new body called the Central Cultural Revolution Group. Well, the head started to roll now. If the likes of, you know, the most sacred of cows like Peng Zhan and Luo Rei Qing weren't safe, well, from Liu Shaoqi down, which was just about everybody, they had to be wondering if that coming tsunami was going to hit them too. Then came May 1966. This is when things really begin to ramp up. The next head to get chopped was another, uh, I guess you could call him a you know, good and decent and devoted communist, the cultural minister, Lu Ding Yi. He was a Peng man all the way. And it was Lu Ding Yi who had, you know, he was the one who had been keeping all the most inciting leftist writings, you know, regarding culture and propaganda out of the party line. He had been Peng's main guy to deflect all these Maoist voices that were trying to challenge the stalwarts running China in the early 60s. So Lu Ding Yi went down in flames. I won't get into details here, but the whole matter of how Lin Biao brought about his downfall ranks as one of the most 
fascinating and bizarre stories in party history. For the month of May in 1966, Liu Shaoqi had to lead the charge against all his friends, allies, and comrades. Peng Zhen, Luo Ruiqing, Lu Dingyi, Yang Shangkun, all of them. Guilty on all charges against them, none of which could be proved, but suffice to say, these men failed to place their chips on Chairman Mao, and after living in limbo for so long, their fates were finally sealed. Lined up against what was now referred to officially as the Peng Luo Lu Yang anti-party clique were the forces of Mao, led by Kang Sheng, Jiang Qing, Chen Bo Da, Zhang Chunqiao, Yao Wenyuan, Guan Feng, Qi Ben Yu, Wang Li, Mu Xin, and a power base of young, left-leaning, radical followers of Mao Zedong thought in the strictest sense. And these numbers were not small. Mao knew exactly what kind of team he was building. This group, by the way, became the central power inside the Cultural Revolution group, and it was this group that Mao used as his primary instrument of terror and authority for the entirety of the Cultural Revolution. But what about Zhou Enlai? Where did he stand? I suppose there are many different ways to look at this. I'm of the position, always have been, that Zhou Enlai did what he had to do. He was always Mao's number two, even though Liu Shaoqi outranked him in the official pecking order. He did what he had to do, and on May 21st, 1966, Zhou had to stand before his old friends and allies and say, quote, In less than half a year, the true faces of the four big families, meaning Peng, Luo, Lu, Yang, have been fully exposed. And this has not been a simple matter. The struggle had only just begun when they took our positions away one by one. Now we must take them back one by one. They wave the red banner to oppose the red banner and have spread plenty of toxin. Now that this time bomb has been removed, the center is even more united. Joe and Lai, everybody. So we're off and running. The first major purge of the Cultural Revolution, now done. They had fallen from power, these four. Now came the brutal violence and humiliation. This was carried out with gusto in the first week of June and in the months and years to follow. Not just these guys, as we learned from the previous episodes covering Deng Xiaoping, Bo Yibo, and Xi Jinping, everyone in that person's immediate orbit was also sucked into the vortex. Wives, sons, daughters, close aides, political allies. There was no escape. The entirety of Peng Zhen's team was gutted. It's still in the ramping up stage here in mid-1966. Once it gets whipped up into a frenzy, later 66 and all of 67, it becomes unstoppable and just takes on a life of its own. Next major one to go was the ethnic Mongol Wulan Fu. He was sort of, he had always been a poster boy of you know, showing how far any one of the 56 ethnic minorities could go in the new China. Wulan Fu was a vice premier which, if you ask me, is pretty high up. Anyways, he fell on August 16, 1966, going down in flames as, quote, the biggest party power holder taking the capitalist road in the inner Mongolian autonomous region. And then the suicides begin to happen with greater frequency. May, June, 1966, many who knew they faced the cruelest of fates took their own lives rather than be allowed to fall into the unforgiving maw of the unfolding cultural revolution. And just because these people who killed themselves were dead, the struggle went on against their husbands, wives, children. You'll remember Bo Yibo's wife during her period of incarceration during the cultural revolution. She was driven to suicide. That is, if she wasn't killed outright. Yeah, it was all starting to happen right about now. Summer 1966. The swinging 60s. We already saw Wang Dongxing took over from Yang Shangkun in the general office. And none other than Marshal Ye Jian Ying took over from the fallen Luo Ruiqing. Now this is important because these two, Ye and Wang, are going to later play a starring role when the end finally comes in October 76. But it's here these two rise to these great heights of power. Things were looking up for Chairman Mao. His plan to utilize Jiang Qing to light a brush fire that smoked out Peng Zhan and led to the fall of Peng Luo Lu and Yang worked brilliantly. 
Those guys were out, and Mao was stuffing the bureaucracy with his people. I mean, with Lin Biao, he already had the army and the entire security apparatus. He had the finest and leftist writers and intellectuals spewing out his dogma and getting his word out. Now came the main event for Mao, and this was to overthrow China's head of state, none other than Liu Shaoqi himself. To achieve this end, Mao came up with a rather extreme plan. His plan was to carefully orchestrate what amounted to mass chaos on the streets that no one could possibly control. It would be full-scale shock and awe tactics, but without the bombs and bullets. It would be like nothing ever seen before in PRC history. And when it was all over, Mao seemed pretty sure he'd get his man. Now, it's important to remember up to now, the Cultural Revolution that you know we all are familiar with, that ruined so many people's lives, it hadn't really started yet. The circles, you know, like these guys like Peng Zhan, Lu Dingyi, the circles they walked in were, you know, a million miles away from, you know, what the normal guy on the street uh, faced. But, you know, but that was all about to change. Intellectuals on the right were the first ones to see what was coming. And those on the left, particularly the extreme left, they saw their moment of revenge was coming. They just needed some dictator with absolute power and authority to sort of sanction whatever destruction and killing they were, you know, about to do. And just as Wuhan's play, Hai Rui, dismissed from office, was used as the spark to bring down the first wave of political victims, so it was that Nie Yuanzi's big character poster, or Da Zi Bao, was used to create chaos inside Peking University, and from there, the conflagration spread throughout China's middle schools and universities. Nie Yuanzi was distantly related to Marshal Nie Rongzhen, and to make a long story short, because I want to start to wind things up before we call it a day, she was one of many leftists, you know, with an axe to grind against a whole bunch of people who she felt had slighted her or didn't show her the respect she felt she was due. Nie Yuanzi went as far back as Yan'an, and now she was 45 years old, working in the philosophy department of Peking University. And just as Mao sent Jiang Qing to talk to Yao Wenyuan to make the opening chess move against Peng Zhen, this time the sinister Kang Sheng sent his wife, Cao Yiyo, to go talk to Nie Yuanzi, who they knew from their Yan'an days. Cao Yiyo whispered the right things in her ear and made it be known that whatever she says, no one's going to touch her. She was untouchable. I just want to interject here. You had three wives throughout the entirety of the Cultural Revolution who just stirred things up the most. There was Jiang Qing, of course, Mao's wife. Then you also had Cao Yiyo, who I said was Kang Sheng's wife and ally. And then there was Lin Biao's wife, Ye Chun. And as we trudge through the history of the Cultural Revolution, time and again, these three women will rear their ugly heads, destroying lives wherever they went. So anyways, in her infinite wisdom, what Nie Yuanzi did with Cao Yiyo's coaching and her husband Kang Sheng also participating in the setup of this intricate drama, always behind the scenes, of course, uh, they decided that Nie should write a Da Zi Bao, a big character poster. And so, on the fateful day of May 25th, 1966, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Nie Yuanzi's Da Zi Bao gets pasted up in Peking University, and it directly attacked the university leadership, chiefly a man by the name of Lu Ping. But in May 1966, he was fighting for his life after being attacked so openly and brazenly at, at a time when the world for so many in China was beginning to tip over on its side. His protectors, Peng Zhan and Lu Dingyi, they were gone. These Peking University leaders, they were on their own. And Nie Yuanzi and her closest comrades in this act, in this drama, they knew it. They knew the university establishment was totally unprotected, so that's when it all started. The flames that started burning were quickly fanned, and by the evening of May 25th, even Zhou Enlai had to get involved. And Chen Bo Da, he was freaking out. Peng's successor, Li Xuefeng, had to personally go down to Peking Yu and appeal to the students to please be more orderly in carrying out their revolution. This was a very provocative act Nie Yuanzi did. She didn't only attack the university leadership, she also attacked the whole 
Beijing Municipal Committee. And there was a lot of fighting all over the campus about what she did. You know, some were, of course, for her, and some against what she did. Thought she had gone too far. So while this raged within the walls of Peking University, Kangsheng dutifully sent a copy of the poster to Mao, who, you know, remember, is still down in the south in Hangzhou. So he receives the poster on June 1st. While forces on both sides were arguing the merits of the Datsu Bao down in Beijing, Chairman Mao wrote on the poster the following words, which made everything 100% clear for all to understand. He wrote, quote, It is very important that this text be broadcast in its entirety by the Xinhua News Agency and published in all the nation's newspapers. Now the smashing of the reactionary stronghold that is Peking University can begin. Unquote. And so at 8.30 that night, the content of the poster was broadcast on the radio. Then the next day, on June 2nd, 1966, the poster was printed in the People's Daily. Then there was also this uh, accompanying essay written by Chen Boda that, you know, completely gave the thumbs up for, you know, Nie Yuanzi's Da Zi Bao. And Liu Shaoqi, the number two man in the whole party, he was left out of the loop. He was finding stuff out only as it happened. And he was the number two man in the country, Mao's successor. So why was Mao not keeping him informed? Pretty drastic things began to happen. Classes at all levels ceased in Beijing. And then on June 13th, this cessation of classes went nationwide. No school. Every, all school was out. Nobody went to classes anymore. The first week of June 1966 was when you really noticed for the first time something abnormal was going on. There, were, you know, there was factional fighting that broke out in the universities and all school authorities were being attacked. On June 9th, Liu Shaoqi flew down to Hangzhou with Deng Xiaoping, Chen Boda, and Tao Zhu to basically tell Mao things were sort of spiraling out of control and for something this big, they needed his leadership on the spot. And I'll spare you the details, but they all went back to Beijing sans Mao. They went back empty-handed. That's when Liu and Deng knew... Chairman Mao was going to let them dangle and, you know, become consumed by everything that was about to happen. But the funny thing was, no one knew yet what was about to happen. In a way, it was starting to look like the old 1957 anti rightist campaign. But it quickly got much uglier than that, and everyone in some position of authority held their breath. Liu and Deng went back and tried to deal with the situation. But it was like trying to put out a house on fire with one bucket of water at a time. Even before they left to see Mao, things in Beijing were starting to spin out of control. So what Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping did was to set up these work teams, 400 and all, that fanned out across the middle schools and universities in Beijing, Shanghai, and elsewhere. Liu and Deng were pinning their hopes on these work teams going out and meeting with these students and letting them blow off some steam, and then after a while, things would settle down. And wherever these work teams went, they saw thousands and thousands of Datsu Bo everywhere. Some, you know, long-winded, and some only several characters in length. And the first targets were the leaders of the universities and the professors and teachers. Everyone was doing their damnedest to somehow, some way, not be branded as some part of some counter-revolutionary black gang. If you had that taint, then you became an instant target. I mean, these were days when the students were just screaming at each other, and the first struggle sessions started breaking out. There was a particularly violent one that broke out at Peking U on June 18th. On this date, Paul McCartney's 24th birthday, the first real violence of the Cultural Revolution happens. 60... Peking University professors, lecturers, party cadres were gathered together on a makeshift stage and just manhandled, cultural revolution style. You know, this included, you know, the usual stuff, you know, dunce hats, having insulting words pinned to their clothes, having the faces smeared with black ink, being forced to kneel in uncomfortable positions for a long period of time, having half their heads shaved, and having their clothes torn. Pretty soon... This will be a normal, everyday thing. But on June 18th, 1966, it was pretty shocking and unprecedented. As people began to see the writing on the wall, many tried to inoculate themselves from future potential attack by going on the offensive and directly attacking their friends. 
colleagues, even family. This is where people's survival instincts took over and they did what they had to do. And all the while, Mao remained coy, hanging back and, you know, getting constant updates. And It's important to note that the updates were all coming from the top people of the Cultural Revolution group who were about as self-serving a lot as you could possibly think of. And so it went on for the rest of June. And these work groups did their best to try and establish some semblance of order, but the hot-headed students you know, saw them as the establishment, just trying to neutralize them and shut them up. This period where the work teams were sent out was known as the 50 Days. For these approximately 50 days, Mao slowly allowed Liu and Deng to hang themselves. He knew there was nothing they could do, and if they tried to restore order, they were counter-revolutionary. If they did nothing, they would be swallowed up by the events violently unfolding. June turned into July, and now Mao was getting ready to spring his trap. He made a well-publicized visit to his old hometown of Shaoshan during the closing days of June 1966. Then on July 16th of that year, he did something incredibly dramatic. There was an annual event held in Wuhan where locals would swim across the Yangtze as a show of endurance and stamina. And in the 11th year of this event's running, Mao decided to join in, and the 72-year-old chairman joined 5,000 others in swimming across the Yangtze. He was in the water for something like 65 minutes and swam, it said, for 10 miles. Now, the symbolism of this event was not lost on anyone. This was Chairman Mao letting everyone know he still had it. Two days later, he makes his first return to Beijing in nine months. Remember, he bolted back in October 1965 to the south to plan this grand strategy. Well, now he was back. He went straight to the Diao Yutai guesthouse compound where the Cultural Revolution group was holed up. When Liu Shaoqi heard Mao was in situ, he sought him out, but was turned away at the door. Mao had no time to see his number two. But Mao did make time to meet with Kang Sheng and Chen Boda. Liu got some face time with Mao the next day, and Mao just dumped on him. Mao tells Liu he's totally dissatisfied with how he handled things with this cultural revolution up till now. Then on July 24, 25, 26, Mao calls a meeting of all the top leaders to his villa at Diao Yutai, in his pajamas, no less. Mao berates those who had the audacity to send out these work teams that suppressed the students and prevented them from carrying out revolution. So if you read between the lines, Mao was saying, how dare any of you try to prevent chaos from erupting? He demanded that all these work teams be recalled. And Mao was incensed that the work teams were trying to suppress the students, not learn from them. Well, we'll close with Mao's final act in July of 1966. On July 29th, there was this big rally held at the Great Hall of the People. 10,000 students and teachers packed inside to hear Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, and Liu Shaoqi one by one explain what the Cultural Revolution was supposed to be and listened you know, as they backpedaled on the heavy-handed tactics that the work teams used in carrying out their work. And the crowd also listened to these leaders' uncertainty about what the Cultural Revolution was supposed to be all about. And then suddenly, he appeared. Unannounced and unbeknownst to the three leaders, there he was, all along, behind a curtain, secretly listening to everything being said, and not agreeing with anything, of course, and he suddenly walks onto the stage to thunderous applause and pandemonium, of course, and, you know, chairs of long live Chairman Mao, and, you know, whatnot... This marked the end of the so-called 50 days. Now, things were going to take a different course. On the one hand, Liu and Deng must have felt relieved that Chairman Mao was back in town to maintain order. But on the other hand, they soon found out all Mao was about to do was just pour gasoline on the fire and that all his wrath was about to be focused on them. And we're going to pick up next time to see how this you know, all plays out. We'll pick up in August 1966 with the 16-point decision in Mao's own Datsa Bao, when the Cultural Revolution starts to pick up more steam. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from high above midtown Manhattan in New York City.
No, I'm not here for the Facebook IPO. I'm here for a trade show and to visit customers. Back in Claremont sometime next week, and I'm already counting down the seconds to that. Take care, all my wonderful and good-looking listeners, and I hope you'll come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.